Thank you for joining us. Uh, we will start, oh, we will start with um, our board secretary taking a roll call to establish a quorum. Thank you. President Craighead? Here. Member Benitez? Here. Member Lopez? Present. Member Miller? Here. Member Otto? Here. We have a quorum. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and next, I will invite our student representative from CAMS, Kyla Marie uh, Diaz, uh, to lead us in the pledge. Kyla. Put your right hand over your heart. Ready, begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, will live teen, justice for all. For those of you present in the room, the board appreciates and supports community input at our meetings. During the meeting, there will be time for the public to comment <coughs> on matters on the agenda and matters not on the agenda. For those who have not already submitted a request, we have provided forms in the back of the room and also have additional copies by where our board secretary um, is sitting. If you wish to speak during the meeting, please fill out a form indicating your name and the agenda item you wish to address. The board has been meeting in closed session regarding matters listed on today's agenda and took action on the following items. Item 3.1 confidential student matters. Pursuant to California Education Code 35146, the board voted 4-0 with board member Miller absent to lift the expulsion of student ID number 7286 and assign them to a school or instructional program as recommended by the Office of Student Placement Services. Item 3.2, public employee appointment the board voted 4-0 with board member Miller absent to approve appointments of Astrid Feist as assistant director of Head Start and Missy Sykes as assistant principal at Bret Hart Elementary School. Congratulations. Uh, and item 3.3, conference with legal counsel, existing litigation, the board voted 4-0 with board member Miller absent to approve a settlement in workers' compensation cases 19791571, and 14566355. Um, let's see, do we have uh, do we have Astrid Feist and um, Missy Sykes here? We'd like to acknowledge you. No, they're not here. I still congratulate them on their new positions. Okay, um, adoption of the agenda. I'm going to need a motion. I move to approve. Any discussion? No. Um, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? That passes 5-0. Um, okay. Oh, uh, let's see. We have our student representative from CAMS, and she led us in the pledge. That's Kyla. Um, so, Kyla, I'm going to have you come to the uh, podium, and it is your turn you have the floor hi everyone my name is kyla dias uh i am a senior at cams but i am also the asb president so uh, a few couple things i just want to say uh about cams uh we're doing pretty well we just started off great introducing our new mascot cams coyotes um, and then so administration, ASB, and PTSO, our parent-teacher student organization, have worked together to emphasize the coyotes through apparel, logos around campus, and messages. We will soon have our own very own mascot for following CAMS events. We have introduced the incoming class of 2027 with our Link Crew program and hosted a game night for them. ASB had also created engaging activities for more freshman participation, like a scavenger hunt. And we also held a back-to-school night 
uh, recently uh, <clears throat> for students and family members for introduction of teachers and planned coursework for the year. ASB had also had a welcome rally to introduce our new staff, Mr. Yu, the, the assistant principal, and Mr. Tomas, security. Our Korean Dance Culture Club, or KDC, performed wonderfully at that time. Our annual club rush is this Friday. We have a total of 104 clubs and interest groups, but 74 of them will be participating in the quad. The clubs will be able to showcase to current and new members. We, don't, we do not need to worry because any person can join the majority of the clubs throughout the year. FIRST Robotics Competition has been working hard to travel to San Jose for an off-season competition. They have pre previously won a World's Archimedes Division in Houston. The following weeks, they will host FRC competitions at Da Vinci and FIRST Technical Challenges at our school. VEX will be accepting applications as well during Club Rush. Both robotics teams are two of the most engaged clubs at CAMS, but we also have Mecha, Movimento, and Estudiante, Chicano de Aztlan, and Huevete. <laughs> From last Friday, September 15 to October 15, we celebrate our Hispanic Heritage Month, in which we invite clubs to represent their culture. It is that time of the year where seniors are working on college applications. With the help of Ms. Gomez and Ms. Johnson Nagoto, they work collaboratively to make our lives easier. We had one-on-ones about graduation check <clears throat> and any assistant with college applications. There are weekly workshops from colleges like Notre Dame, UCSD, UC Merced, USC, and many more. The college support that CAMS has given is exceptional. The College and Career Center also have provided us with many internship <coughs> programs and scholarships. I was involved with the Boeing internship thanks to, <coughs> thanks to the workshop. Um, our Wellness Center has been providing us with workshops for the students. For this week, we have a wellness outreach, journaling workshop, Tranquility Thursday, and bracelet making. Athletes for our fall, fall sports have been going pretty well. Girls Volleyball is going uh, <clears throat> both Varsity and Junior Varsity Coastal League really well. They just won a couple games. Their senior night will be next Wednesday. Girls Tennis are also going strong with 2-0 in the Moore League. They had a couple games this week, as well as boys and girls cross country went to their first meet well in the Coastal League yesterday afternoon. Some of our winter sports like boys basketball and girls soccer have started their practices. ASB will host fall games, a week of grade level competition for a good engagement with our school. It leads to more exciting events like Red Ribbon Week and Spirit Week. <clears throat> Other upcoming events include our fall dance. Fall dance will be hosted at our school, which is Halloween theme. ASB has been selling tickets for camp students and guests. The students will get them food, dessert, and photo booth pictures for a scary good time. <laughs> We would also like to invite you to our biggest event, Halloween, also known as Taste of Camps, which has numerous clubs selling food and fun activities to explore life at camps. Many clubs will be able to showcase and perform for our audience, which includes dance team. There will be student tours available to those interested in learning more about camps. All in all, I will say that camps is doing well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, and if you could stick around a little bit, we have um, a retiree to, to recognize and honor, and then we'll take a little break to do um, pictures. OK. Uh, so tonight, um, we would like to recognize Matt Wood. So um, Matt. <laughs> um, hi. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna just say a few words about you and your service, and then we'll have you walk around, receive handshakes and things, and then um, you'll have your turn at the podium. Um, <clears throat> so we are honoring you for 24 years of service. You are retiring as the executive director of the Technology Information Services Branch, 
And we are praising you tonight for showing great adaptability in the face of ever-changing technology demands. That is an understatement. And um, developing LBUSD's cybersecurity program, which is data-driven and provides a multitude of tools to protect the district, and that has been tested. Um, leading strategic work to reimagine new business systems for the district and to align your department staffing and resources to future technology needs. So please accept this certificate for your 24 years of dedicated service to the Long Beach Unified School District and your lasting contributions to the lives of thousands of students. So come on around. So good evening. <laughs> President Craighead, board members, Superintendent Baker, senior team, friends and colleagues, thank you so much for the kind words. I'm very humbled by the recognition. I'd like to start tonight by introducing my family who have joined me here tonight. This is the part where you stand. <laughs> First is my wonderful, beautiful wife and greatest supporter, Bernadette. Our daughter, Madison, who's a product of LBUSD from pre-K through the ACT program and known by many here tonight. <laughs> Our daughter, Cassie, she's a PhD candidate, and this is just for you, Jay Camarino, at USC. <laughs> and our third daughter, daughter, Monica, who is here from Colorado to help us celebrate and to plan for her wedding in November. This is my family. This is my universe. Thank you. <laughs> so why am I here tonight? <laughs> Obviously, I'm retiring, but why am I here tonight? And it really comes down to uh, there's a form you have to fill out when you retire. And on that form is a checkbox. And that checkbox says, do you wish to attend the Board of Education meeting when they accept your retirement? And I thought about that quite a lot and thought there's probably a myriad of reasons why people would check that box. And I th uh, thought about all those very different reasons that people might have. But for me, the why uh, was to say thank you. Uh, thank you for allowing me to be part of the LBUSD family for 25 years. Uh, thank you for the support, trust, and the opportunities. Thank you for my daughter's education. Thank you for your fellowship and friendship. <clears throat> I've worked with each of you over the years, and I've appreciated your professionalism and untiring pursuit of excellence. We've collaborated, discussed, debated, and disagreed. Through it all, though, I never doubted the sincerity and passion of LBUSD leaders to do what is best for our students. I've had the privilege to work with amazing administrators, talented teachers, dynamite directors, and classy classified staff. It's also been my honor to lead the fantastic team in technology and information services for the last 13 years. The best team I could have ever hoped for. I'm proud to say that I am Tisby forever. 
I owe you all a debt of, gr of gratitude, but I especially want to thank two people tonight. First, Ruth Ashley, wherever she is in her retirement this evening, for starting me on my leadership journey and opening my eyes to the kind of leader that I wanted to be. And a big thank you to Yumi Takahashi for supporting me and challenging me with new ideas and different points of view. Thank you for being the mentor to me that I tried to be to others. Retirement is a difficult concept to wrap your head around. <clears throat> How do we stop doing what we've done for 46 years? How, the truth is that we don't stop. We change, we grow, we evolve. Just as we changed and grew and evolved during our working years. I'll continue that in my retirement. LBUSD is a big chapter in my book of life. Now it's time for a new chapter and I'm excited to turn the page. Two weeks ago, Cindy Young talked about legacy. And I thought about that and after 25 years, decided I should be able to leave you with some pearl of wisdom regarding that. Um, I recall that I was asked to give advice uh, to the most recent graduating class of the state's chief technology mentoring program. And I said to them, don't look to be remembered for the networks you create and the systems you upgrade, but for the teams you create and the people you uplift. This is your true legacy. I will forever keep these memories, but as I retire, I leave my legacy in your hands. Please take care of it. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, and we will. And now we will uh, take pictures. So I'm going to invite our CAM student, Kyla and Matt, come on up here. And we'll just, we'll just take a little break and do some pictures. So the board will come out front. and. We'll resume soon. Okay, and next we have um, a presentation from the Special Education Community Advisory Committee, or CAC, and I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Simon to get us started. Thank you so much, Board President Craighead, and good, good evening to everyone, to our, our, I'm sorry, yes. No, I'm sorry. What I should have said was, um, Kyla, you're welcome to... Uh, join us the rest of the meeting um, and also Matt and your and your beautiful family you're welcome to join us for the rest of the meeting but if you would prefer to go and celebrate I know this is a big decision but if you would prefer to go and celebrate um, 
you can use this time to um, to do so. <laughs> thank you, and thank you for the reminder. I know when I forget something. <clears throat> so I, I'm sorry for interrupting. See, I was going to ask him to stay, but thank you. So good evening, uh, Board President Craighead, Board members, uh, Superintendent Baker, district staff, and community. Uh, this evening, I'm honored to introduce right, the former chair of the Special Education Community Advisory Committee, CAC, and current LBUSD parent, Katie Gonzalez, who is joined by several parents and teachers in LBUSD. They are here to present the Community Advisory Committee recommendations as prepared by the Local Plan Subcommittee of the LBUSD Special Education Community Advisory Committee. CAC. But before we begin the presentation, please allow me to communicate the purpose of the Community Advisory Committee, better known as CAC. And its purpose is to work in a positive partnership with the district to support students with disabilities by advising the district of concerns and needs and issues in special education and recommending specific program improvements advising parents on student rights, supporting inclusion of students with disabilities in the general education environment, encouraging involvement of families representing the full ethnic, linguistic, and cultural diversity of our community, to name a few. And without further ado, Ms. Katie Gonzalez. Good evening, board members, Superintendent Baker, and district administrators. Thank you very much for inviting us to your board meeting tonight. Um, I know this, to us it's an honor to be able to work in partnership with the districts. We have the same goals. We do want excellence and equity in our district and we want to continue to help achieve that. So tonight, that I want you to think when you listen to these recommendations, first of all, I, this, this set of recommendations is very different tonight. And it wasn't on purpose. I want to explain our process for choosing recommendations and how we come up with it. At the CAC meeting, we, we hold a workshop and we have these forms that we give out to the parents. And we actually conduct this workshop and get input from all our parents that are present. From that, we go through the forms. We have a subcommittee. We go through the forms separately. And we try to pick the themes that come up and, and, and their recommendations or their experiences. And then we go through the process of looking for our speakers, somebody who could speak to this. And this is, let me tell you, this process, it's not easy for us to speak in front of you guys. It's just not because it, it's a lot of hard work. It takes a lot of courage. And I have the best group here. We care a lot. So that's why we're here. We care so much. We're passionate. We really want to improve um, not just special education for disabled children, we want to improve education experience for every child in LBUSD. That is our mission. And we do want to work in partnership. And I do feel like we have a good partnership with the district because I've seen it where we've made recommendations in the past. You listen and you implement. So we want to continue to work with you. So the first, our first speaker, um, so I forgot the special part. The very special part is everybody here, are edu they're, they're all educators. I didn't choose that on purpose. Actually, that wasn't my plan. I asked a couple other parents, and they just they declined my invitation to speak. But every single speaker tonight is not only a parent of a child that's in LBUSD, a child with disabilities, but they're also an educator. So who better to hear from our frontline staff what is needed to help our kids? And I also want you to think when you're listening to these recommendations, don't listen from a point of, we usually heavily advocate for students with disabilities. That's our, that's our thing. But honestly, looking at these recommendations this year, they fit all students in LBOSD, especially the fifth recommendation. So I really want you to listen openly when you hear each recommendation. This isn't just for kids with disabilities. It's for every child. So our first speaker is um, Ruben Chavez and he'll be doing recommendation one and two. We're gonna start with one first. Thank you. Uh, 
Good evening, school board members and administrators. Um, I'm addressing the board to challenge the retention policy and its implementation in Long Beach Unified. I will state emphatically to all of you, the Long Beach Unified uh, retention policy needs to change specifically to address students with disabilities, IEPs, and 504 plans. Retention is harmful and out of line with current educational best practices in almost all other school districts. According to the National Association of School Psychologists, the research shows that over 100 studies in the last century show that grade retention predicts many negative student outcomes. Considering this, it's troubling that the highest retention rates are found among youth from poor, minority, and inner city backgrounds. The research shows that our struggling students need multi-tiered systems of support not policies like our district's retention policy. This policy causes harm to our students with diagnosed and undiagnosed learning disabilities. The policy punishes students for the district's failings. You're literally altering the course of a child's life in the most negative way and still not providing the supports when they are retained that are research-based. Supports like inclusion, like the CCT model. Uh, supports like reading instruction based on the science of reading. Support such as target, targeted specialized instruction, tutoring, early, identified, early identification of academic challenges and learning disabilities, early academic interventions and remediation. After speaking with several board members and district administrators, I became aware of the fact that it's ed, California Ed Code for a district to have a retention policy in place. Okay, fair enough. According to the district's own data at the May 17th, 2023 board meeting, the district retained 10,000 students between 2007 and 2019. How many of those students retained had IEPs or 504 plans? How many uh, prior to having a student retained, did you ever go back and identify which part of the school safety net failed them? How many of the retained students had learning disabilities or were neurodivergent or were not identified in time to receive early interventions? Have you researched your own data to find which practices and curriculum failed these students to make sure they're not in place anymore? Long Beach Unified's own data illustrated that despite retention, retained students don't perform better than students who qualified for retention but were not retained. The retention policy was amended at the June 7th board meeting and the district staff is to be commended for trying to make positive change. However, there's no mention of the process for students with IEPs and 504s. My daughter received a retention notice when she was in third grade. She had previously been a speech only student and did not receive any academic support from the school up until third grade, even though we had been asking. I can honestly say that the day when we received that retention notice was one of the most stressful, demoralizing and depressing days as a parent. We had been asking for academic support since kindergarten, but instead of support, the district's recommendation was to literally alter the life of my daughter. In the end, my daughter was not retained, but the educational trauma remained. After many meetings, IEPs, phone calls, and emails, we put a plan with supports in place. Now, with the support of her IEP team, she's making steady progress in fifth grade. But I ask you, respective board members, to please amend the board policy to specifically address students with IEPs and 504 plans. And also, look for actual interventions and multi-tiered systems of support and stop retaining our students. So recommendation number one, amend the district retention policy to make the final decision either the parents, the IEP team, or school team. Stop referring to retention as an intervention. Also implement multi-system tiered of support, tiers one, two, and three at all sites. Now recommendation number two, Ruben Chavez. Hello again, board, board members. Um, thank you again, respective board members, for your time and for allowing us to voice our recommendations. I'm addressing you as the father of two Long Beach Unified students to advocate for implementing research-based literacy practices based on the science of reading such as structured literacy. We're currently in the midst of a national literacy crisis. Because illiteracy affects historically disadvantaged students so the most, such as students with disabilities, our black and brown students, and our English learners, this literacy crisis is also a civil rights issue. 
all students have the right to learn how to read. My daughter is a brilliant and creative fifth grader. She's bilingual and biliterate, and she also has dyslexia. Dyslexia is language-based learning disability, which is often expressed in challenges with reading, spelling, and writing. As you may be aware, it's the most common learning disability, with it affecting between 5 to 20 percent of our population. That's up to one in five children in our schools. She has had an IEP since kindergarten, initially for speech only, and we requested academic help in kinder and first, only to be told that she was too young to test. We now know that's not the case. She struggled during distance learning, received zero speech services, and no academic support. So I stepped in. I spent thousands of dollars on structured literacy materials and training that my own district did not provide. I filled in the gaps for my daughter that the school did not provide. As an RSP teacher for 19 years, I also used the structured literacy and science of reading training and materials for my students, and it was an absolute game changer. The numbers don't lie. It was a game changer for my daughter. She's now an avid reader, and reading has now become her academic strength. She reads chapter books, graphic novels, and she writes poetry. It brings me so much joy to see the stack of books next to her bed. Currently, the curriculum in English and English instruction for Long Beach, according to the district website, falls under the umbrella term balanced literacy. Balanced literacy has its roots in whole language and uses strategy for early literacy, such as cueing. For example, look at the picture, look at the first letter, guess the word. Memorizing sight words. However, countless studies have demonstrated balanced literacy strategies are not the way the brain learns to read. The most effective way to teach all students, not just students with dyslexia, all students, is uh, research-based practices such as structured literacy, which is based in the science of reading. 29 states have already passed, or, um, passed laws or implemented other policies requiring students to use evidence-based methods for teaching young students how to read and have made a complete overhaul of their curriculum and instruction. Clearly the literacy methods in place since the 90s, not just at Long Beach but uh, across the country, have not been effective. The numbers don't lie. And those numbers are especially dismal for our students with disabilities, our black students, our brown students, and our economically disadvantaged students. That is not equity. That is not excellence. Teach our students to read. Train your teachers using methods based in the science of reading. Long Beach needs to make early literacy a top priority with specific goals and investment in training teachers. Reading is a civil right. I'm going to end with a quote from Dr. Kareem Weaver, who's leading the fight for literacy for all in Oakland. And I'm paraphrasing his quote. He said, um, don't tell me your mottos. Don't show me your nice websites. Show me your curriculum, show me your staff development calendar, and I will tell you what your values really are as a district. Thank you. So recommendation number two, and I'm sorry there's a little bit of a switch here. Uh, make early literacy a top priority by implementing evidence-based literacy instruction based on the science of reading, such as structured literacy. Adopt a structured phonics curriculum. For, kin for kindergarten through third grade, along with decodable books. Train all teachers and principals in the science of reading. Train all teachers and principals on the early risk factors for dyslexia and other reading challenges, so they may be identified sooner. Set literacy goals for specific student subgroups. And this one's, this one's big for us and this was what we would like as a district, is to adopt a all students can learn to read mission, statement, and culture. Thank you. Dr. Simon, um, just a, a point of clarification, the slide that we're seeing. Uh, okay, thank you, thank you. So there was two different slide decks, sorry. Um, but this is actually the slide deck I want to use. And, so and just works. for a reference, we, we don't have the correct slide deck either. <laughs> there, was, there was some, I'm sorry, I apologize. There were some last minute changes. 
and I was told that the board we couldn't do the last minute changes, so we were very we're reverting back to the original. But this was actually the slide deck that I I put together. All good. We just want we're to make good. sure we're that good. we're we're following. We're good. It's, uh, it's yeah, all yeah. the same all good. content. I promise you, there's no surprises. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, my next speaker is Matthew Seno. Uh, Seno. Seno. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, dear board members, uh, Superintendent Baker, uh, today I am speaking as an advocate for the extension of the co-collaborative uh, co <coughs> uh, collaborative co-teaching uh, program at Emerson Parkside Academy Elementary School and other elementary schools across Long Beach Unified School District. Several years ago, my son attended and thrived at Buffum TLC. And after Buffum, he was assigned to general education classes at a school where he struggled socially and academically. During the past 2022 and 2023 school year, my son attended the CCT program at Emerson Elementary. And the teachers were instrumental in making my son feel welcome. My son learned social cues and made many friends. And my son's progress was due to the teachers and the structure of the CCT program. Although my son still has his ups and downs, these two teachers worked diligently to improve my son's academic performance while teaching him appropriate behaviors. Having an RSP teacher in the classroom has been highly beneficial for the classes mixed with IEP and non-IEP students. The classroom environment is very supportive for all the students. I appreciate the opportunity my son has had to participate in this program. After talking with many of the parents who have children in the CCT program in Emerson, I discovered that many of them were very concerned about the program's changing status for this, this school year in grade four and the 2024 and 2025 school year in grade five. Although there is still some parent concern about how the CCT program has been structured in grade four, I appreciate that the program has been extended beyond grade three at Emerson Parkside Academy. Overwhelmingly, the parents have been happy with the CCT program up to grade three, and they hope that the program is expanded to grade five as well. Many of the parents feel that the CCT program has, been, has greatly benefited their students and as advocate for the program, I would agree with them. Thank you very much. So this brings us to recommendation number three. The collaborative co-teaching model in LBUSD has been a great success and has moved the needle towards total inclusion. LBUSD parents and students love it and want to see it expanded to all grades and school sites. So we want more of it. The CCT program also creates a new generation of general education students who know how to work with neurodiverse uh, individuals. This will translate into future workplaces with real inclusion. We recommend that the district invest in professional development, training of both general ed teachers and special ed staff. The next speaker is Jacinda Pitch. Good evening, Board of Trustees and Superintendent Dr. Baker. It is an honor to be here in this wonderful evening with you. She's already mentioned my name. <laughs> and I have two children who attend LBUSD. Um, I'm not going to disclose a lot of details about them out of respect for their privacy of how they want to proceed it when they are stepping to adulthood. But I am here tonight as their voices and many of the LBUSD students that fall into my ch children's category. I have been tapped by CACs to have a conversation about grading equity. Dr. Brown, Dr. Benista, Superintendent Dr. Baker, and Mrs. Craighead, who is our regular, you got my vote. Mr. Miller, good to see you the other day. And Dr. Simon, I gotta give him peeps because it's on my people, okay? Um, 
For those of you that, that um, do not know, it is a uh, Special Education Community Advisory Committee, CAC, is open to everyone who wants to help students with exceptional needs to obtain an appropriate, high-quality education. At this meeting, I filled out a feedback form for CAC after seeing my child's report cards. The report card did not reflect my child. The lovely number one is marked in all categories with many interventions listed in the box. The reason I say that the report card did not reflect my child was because I happen to be an educator too. With 21 years, majority are in elementary education and the last three years in science middle school. This was a child who taught itself to read by the age of two and taught his siblings to read. The little sibling read by the age of one and a half. The interesting part was I have a parent conferences before the report card was given to me. I told my child's teachers my child's abilities such as reading, spelling words, and can add and subtract, and even no fractions. All the teacher respond was, I did not see that in the class. In my head, I was thinking, does the teacher want to know my child? I guess I conduct my parent-teacher conferences differently because I always start out with my parents about what do I need to know about your child's strength? What is it that you do at home that I can help your child at school? How can I help to improve your child's education? Currently, I'm requesting the team for the less restricted environment in the CCT program so my child has an opportunity to interact with typical peers to learn social skills, language, and academic. My child starts asking a lot of questions. My child would ask, what shape is this? What color is this? What animal form is this? What sounds does the animal make? I answer them. My child would be so happy, clapping his hand and giggling, laughing, and smiling because my child is thinking he or she is talking to his mother. As a mother, my heart breaks because my child is trying so hard to talk to me. Going back to the team, I got shut down by the team and furthermore recommend MS program below my child's current program. The principal was nice about it. The teams recommend MS, but you can pursue it outside. And I apologize about the technical problems. The IEP was conducted on Zoom. On that day, I sat in my car for 10 minutes before driving home. I emailed Mr. Swington, one of your Earth Angels, between stops because I need to talk to get out of my system before arriving home seeing their lovely little faces. My hope got bruised. I told myself when my hope got bruised, I just have to put positive energy into the universe. Just like I followed Dr. Brown, Dr. Bernice, Superintendent Dr. Baker, Dr. Hinn, Dr. Simon, and other LBUSD school on Twitter, currently known as X right now. Some of the school, I don't even know them, but I would press hard and retweeted things that they are proud of and post it in Twitters. I took to the kids to get their hair cut. I drove to South Beach on 2nd Street. I gave $20 to a lady asking for help for her dog and herself, and she replied, God bless you. Definitely, I can use that right now at this moment. I have a, um, she had a smile after seeing the bills. I got fast food, comfort food for dinner because I didn't want to cook. I gave myself a break. I watched three movies, Forrest Gump, Life of Pi, and The Curious Case of Benjamin Button, and listened to uh, Mr. Joe Austin uh, preaching so I could write this speech, you know, to you guys coming from a good place, you know, and helping our kiddos in LVUSD, and hopefully other districts will follow across the state and the nations. I am hoping you will take the lead in reforming the grading system, just like you did getting the COVID vaccine for educators and other district followers. Just a report card and IEP meeting really affected my social and emotional well-being and my self-esteem because I could not make teachers see my child and what my child is capable of, and yet in many years, education background, too, did not count. The grading system is failing our children, and I'm asking you to revise and again reform this grading system so it will benefit our students and reflects their capability. Just like Mrs. Maya Angelou's statement, do the best you can until you know better. Then when you know better, do better. Currently, my, child, my children are doing the best they can until they know better. But as a district, you know better. So I'm asking you to do better in reforming the grading system for the betterment of our children's educations. When we were on shutdown, and I quickly, um, we went quickly into distant learning. In one of staff development meetings, and by the way, I don't, I don't work in the district. I work in another district. My principal addressed us this morning. She almost fell out of her chair when she looked at the student grade. Our school is 612. One of the students was in her senior year, but yet she received an F in one of the classes. She did not call out a teacher, but make a general statement. The child's earned good grades since um, grade school and including preschool. The child's even earned all A's in all her classes until this shutdown. This F will affect for her um, qualifications for high school graduations and college um, acceptance. Human nature always got the best of us. I always wanted to prove that I am right and you are wrong. The teacher called herself out and stated the student did not complete her assignment. Then the principal asked, what intervention and extra support did you provide to that student and did you document it? The child worked hard all her life and this effort will affect her. And I was thinking, wow, this is a great principal that I'm working with. And by the way, I transferred there after three months when we went to shut down. 
This child is extremely lucky to have this principal. Just imagine for one second if that principal did not intervene, this child's future would be different. And I hope everyone here agree with me. I emailed Dr. Heenan, another one of your Earth Angels. This part of the email with revision for this speech. In our last meeting, it was a difficult topic, great. How do we make great equity for our kiddos? The first time I stepped into LBUSD as a new parent and I met Dr. Tiffany Brown during one of CAC events, the district invited different organizations as resources for us to enroll our children, like horse riding and swimming lesson. I mentioned to her, I don't know where I stand on the education side or parent side. She said to me that I will never forget, you don't have to choose sides. You can be on both sides. So for this speech, I'm going to be on both sides. When lives are not playing fair with our students as a teacher, I am going to even out the playing field for all my students, especially in the grading area. This is how grading affects our students. Grading affects high school graduations, financial aids, and college assistance. I am not um, promoting Amazon Prime or Jack Ryan series, but I like to quote this from season eight, three and episode eight. We have done our jobs and we've done it well. This fight was passed down to us, will be continue on with or without us, but we'll always be better than the institution we serve. And what is and that is what matters when it matters most. There are no heroes in our professions, but occasionally there are good men, men who act what is right, not simply do what they told. I'm not always live my life with honor, but perhaps I have done enough to die with it. I hope the same for you. Laws and policy are put in place for the betterment of humanity. We can always go back to, I mean, go back to revise, add, or delete. They are saying, if you want to see the humanity of societies, take a look at how they educate their children. I am going to conclude. We are the gatekeeper of humanity. Whether we like it or not, it is our duty. And I want to leave you with this assessment cartoon, but they say don't have it on a PowerPoint, but I thank you for your time. In this cartoon, you have the crow, the monkey, the penguin, the elephant, the fish, and the seal, and the dog. And so this is the assessor who says, for this fair selection, everybody have to take the same exam. Please climb that tree. So, All right. OK, so that's just my conclude. Thank you, Jacinda. <clears throat> so recommendation for grading equity. We need to change the way our students are graded as standardized tests are not a one size fits all. Other methods need to be deployed to meet our kids where they are so they can reflect what they know. For example, kids can show their knowledge during class time or be given a test in ways that the, that the students could perform. Test anxiety for our kids is real and class assessments are not always a true indicator of what they have learned. We recommend getting rid of time tests. Also, report cards should highlight our children's strength, not only their deficits. And we have one more. Unfortunately, our last speaker, um, she is ill, so she asked me to go ahead and do her, her, her um, testimony. And this is for Caroline Thompson. She's a parent and educator. According to LBUSD's website, all schools TK through 12 has access to credentialed school counselors and school psychologists. What happens when that counselor is only available three days per week? or the school psychologist a few hours per month. Why do schools have a 0.6 counselor? We can all accept an increased rates of mental health disorders among our youth in a post-COVID world. In 2021, rates indicated 17% of our youth, ages six to 17, experience a mental health disorder. That is one in six kids. If my daughter's school has 447 kids, that is 75 students with a mental health disorder. How can a counselor support a site with 75 students with mental health disorders? Three days per week. As an educator myself, I appreciate the struggle our school system is experiencing. We are understaffed. This causes us to be overworked, which leads to being overwhelmed. The educators on the front lines are counselors, behavior specialists, school psychologists, we are outnumbered by a significant amount. It is not possible to support all of our students with a counselor three days per week. At the elementary site, the current counselor to student ratio is one counselor for every 843 students. The recommended ratio is one for 250. <clears throat> Counselors have almost three times more students on their caseload than what is recommended. 
We need to do better. Long Beach Unified and all other school districts have a problem. We are getting more students with emotional and mental health problems. And we're getting them younger and younger each year. And we are outnumbered. <clears throat> we need to do better. Every elementary needs a full-time counselor. This should be standard protocol. Staff need additional professional development training and coaching on mental health and trauma-informed practices. All elementary schools will benefit from a wellness center. We can't keep kicking the problem down the road. We need to face it now and prepare, and prepare our teachers for what is coming. I spoke in front of the school board over a year ago and I told them a trauma pandemic was coming. I think we could have been better prepared for this school year. There have been many parents and LBUSD staff indicating their support for additional counselors and mental health support at the site level. The staff are screaming for help. Please direct all your help and resources you can towards the teachers and service providers. School educators are also leaving, are already leaving the profession at record numbers. If we don't help lessen the workload, staff will continue to leave edu the education field. So this brings us up to our last recommendation, recommendation number five, and it's on mental health. And to me, I feel like this is the most important one of all. Expand wellness centers to every elementary school in LBUSD and hire full-time counselors at every school site. Also, I, I'm gonna put in my wish list, more school psychologists, more school nurses, more social workers too. Many students K through 12 are in need of mental health services as they are still recovering from the aftermath of the pandemic. Unless we address their trauma, they will not be able to learn to their full potential. Staff train, training about trauma-informed care and other mental health condi conditions, anxiety, panic attacks, depression, suicidal e uh, ideation, et cetera, is warranted. Let's get rid of the stigma and support our future generations. And that concludes our um, recommendations for tonight. Thank you very much for allowing us to speak. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I believe Mr. Miller had um, something to say. Yes, I do. Uh, first off, I'd like to give a big thank you to all of the folks from CAC that are both pre who have presented today. So Katie, Ruben, Matthew, Jacinda, and everybody in the audience. Let's give them a big round of applause. So for the past couple of months, uh, we've discussed a number of system inequities within the Long Beach Unified School District. Now, I say this as a proud Long Beach Unified graduate and as a man with a child who's also going through this system who has a disability. Um, but I cannot sit here, participate in the CAC meetings, and think about how there are points within the system that we're just sitting on our laurels. Uh, we're um, resting in what a number of people call the Long Beach Way. Um, as I reflect on the CAC meeting that I went to uh, just a couple of days ago, uh, the part that gives me uh, a lot of hope and uh, a lot of excitement about uh, what I want for my daughter is that I see a group of parents that want what I want, just an educational environment that is conducive to success. This group, all they want to do is be heard. They just want to be seen. They want to feel that the district has their back like every other student in this district. So to this, I'm going to request a challenge or I'm going to ask, I'm going to challenge the district. And so uh, Jill and the admin staff, I have a request. I would like to see a full response on what we can and cannot do to support these recommendations. It's not just enough for us to sit here and acknowledge the request. Um, so upon that challenge, uh, in the response, I would like to know how will this affect the campuses? How would meeting their request affect the budget? And how would their request affect staffing? With all due respect, the strength of our district 
lies in the overall determination of what we do to help our districts most vulnerable. And I hope that my challenge helps us all rise to the occasion. With this, our students deserve nothing less than creating a more just, a more equitable, an inclusive educational system. I was so excited to see that this was going to be uh, on our board agenda today. Uh, and from the folks who were present at the last CAC meeting, I think some of you guys saw how passionate I am about this topic. Uh, all due respect, uh, it is time for us to start to step up. And so I'm asking the district to not only hear these recommendations, but let's, let's respond. Let's respond with action on what we can and cannot do. And so uh, I look forward to those responses. And once again, I just want to thank everybody uh, from the CAC committee, those parents, those educators, those one-to-one -one aides for coming out today, because I really appreciate your advocacy. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Lopez. Yeah, thank you for your presentation. Uh, I do want to remind our leadership team that uh, we were uh, we were told we would have those retention guidelines in August, and I hope that tonight's uh, presentation, uh, since we don't have them yet, the board has not received them, will include some of the feedback that we've heard tonight. Thank you. Um, well, I'd like to thank you all for your presentation. Oh, did you have something? Oh, yes, I'm sorry. Dr. My, Benitez. I just my turn. Thank you. For I want to echo Mr. Miller's um, comments and, and observations. I want to thank you all uh, again for, for being here and, and all the work really that's uh, involved. Um, so I'm, I have sort of a system question for us in relation to Mr. Miller's. Um, and, and I'll direct it to Dr. Simon. So Dr. Simon, um, we've received recommendations before from CAC, and we go through uh, this exercise, right? And, and from time to time, uh, Dr. Simon, we were getting uh, updates on progress toward previous recommendations. And I know, Katie, you said these are different from the previous, but, but I think absent um, us receiving updates on recommendations that have already been made. Uh, I, was, I still remember the resolution, uh, the important resolution that sort of set the framework for ongoing recommendations. And, and if you recall, Katie, I think you and many others were here. All, all, all students with disabilities are similar students, right? Yep, yep. Um, and, and, and so to me, um, that resolution that we passed anchors not just the ability to make these recommendations, but to hold ourselves accountable um, to, to the progress that's made and to the opportunities that we still have to uh, continue to improve. So, so my first question in relation to Dr. Uh, I'm, doctor, I'm calling you a doctor already, to Mr. Miller's, um, is um, um, as, as part of our sort of update, Dr. Simon, uh, it is important for us to uh, also show what we've been doing, what we haven't uh, yet uh, you know, accomplished or fulfilled. Uh, because I think on, on two levels for me, um, it holds us accountable, first and foremost, uh, right? Because um, it, 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 in essence, the, the recommendations are beautifully articulated, beautifully presented and written, uh, but, but then how do we measure whether we're actually accomplishing this, right? Uh, I've gone through three sets of recommendations, including the resolution, and they all anchor that we can do better by the IEP process, uh, right? And, and, and not just in a philosophical way, but they have, there have been concrete recommendations made, and I want to anchor it to this previous meeting, because we're, we're on the street is we had some serious interpretation and translation uh, challenges at yes. this previous meeting. And this has been an ongoing uh, question and concern. So if we are still having these very concrete, um, I'll just say it, structural deficits, right, from a system perspective, um, if we can't get those things right and in order, then it makes it very difficult, all right, for uh, caregivers and parents to even feel welcome, uh, right, to, to take the courage to come in here and speak 
uh, today. So there are nuts and bolts things that I think um, need to not just get fixed, right, but systematically um, we shouldn't be dealing with these, you know, not one-offs, but ongoing systemic issues that then allows for us to make concrete progress toward new and, and recommendations. But we got to take care of stuff that's already been recommended. Yeah, I, uh, right? actually, we recommended more school psychologists two years ago. Yep. Um, is because yep. During that time, we were really severely behind on assessments yep. because they, I guess they were on pause for a while during the pandemic. Yep. So... I actually spoke to a school psychologist, and they said that two years ago there was 12 school psychologists that were hired, so you did hire some, yeah. but it's still, I think yeah. it's still needed. Um, the one that I want to thank you for, because I feel like this was the one that we asked for last year, and it actually happened, is we asked for full-time one-to-one aides, okay? And I feel like the district delivered. I heard at the last yep. meeting there yep. were 60 new yep. full-time one-to-one aides, which and has we, and made we signed such a or huge... approved new contracts, so, Katie, as well. Yeah, because, yeah. you know, that's going to help recruit and retain, yeah. you know, hiring them full-time. Yeah. So, so I think in, in the spirit of this, Katie, I think it's important uh, as a part of Mr. Miller's uh, challenge uh, to get uh, concrete updates on an ongoing basis. And, and I... And I Tell me if I'm wrong, uh, Dr. Simon, but we were getting sort of ongoing uh, updates and progress on the recommendations. I don't know how many we got, uh, but, but I think that anchors uh, not just the work of the CAC and all the, 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 the underlying and underpinning of, if I'm a CAC uh, member and I show up at, the, at next Wednesday's uh, meeting, uh, I think it's important to also celebrate, like you just said, mm -hmm. Uh, Katie, because oftentimes where I hear from our community members um, is that the distrust that may already be lingering there gets magnified uh, because we don't also celebrate enough and recognize those things that we're not doing well. So uh, I would just add that to Mr. Miller's challenge that we, we, we need some concrete updates on those previous recommendations um, as we explore then what we're able to do uh, with these recommendations. Thank you. We would like that too. So we yeah. really like the transparency. And when I'm talking about school psychologists now, I mean to help with the mental health crisis yeah. that's happening in our schools. So principals don't have to try to act as the mental health professional. And also secretary act as student nurses, uh, school nurses, as I've heard in some schools. When the school nurse isn't there, the secretary has to act as a school nurse. Yeah. So I know we can always do better, um, but if you want more partnership and how to work on grading equity or how to work on any of these recommendations, we're, we're definitely available. So we're, we're happy to work in, work in partnership. And thank you. I mean, I would just add to that. I think we have uh, presented, I don't think we've presented as far as we need to do a better job of presenting our, our achievements and accomplishments um, in form of what CAC has recommended. I think what we have done is really express and communicated our, um, our highlights really based on a holistic, um, I guess, issue that we're facing within LBUSD. So we, we haven't really piecemealed or, or really parceled out, excuse me. It's been more so what have we done as a district to address, right, mental health, right, by having now 21 middle school wellness centers, by having 11, you know, high school wellness centers, They're family beautiful. resource Thank centers. You. So I think it's just for us, just yeah. breaking that down. So when we do highlight mm -hmm. that, we can say, and this is also a CAC recommendation that we have pursued, or we can just make it just as its own siloed by coming back based on the recommendations of these lovely people standing before us. Um, this is how we have accomplished or how we're tackling those recommendations. Thank you, Dr. Simon. And for my colleagues, and for those of you that have not yet been able to watch our governance uh, board goals uh, session this morning, um, this is what I've been trying to express, right? That unless we focus on subpopulations of students, um, then when we say all students, you know, I like the, I'll use the literacy mm -hmm. uh, one here. Yes, absolutely, we want all students' literacy uh, to increase and grow and make gains. But we also need to eliminate equity gaps while we're doing right. And we, and we yep. need to focus on those populations of students. In this case, our students with disabilities, but it could be our English learners. Mm -hmm. right? It could be our black students. Because if all students uh, gain, uh, but our gaps are not eliminated, uh, then we're back at square one uh, again, right? So th this is the illustrative example that I was trying to share with our group this morning. So I would encourage all of you uh, 
uh, to also weigh in on our conversation around board goals and guardrails because we mm -hmm. had a, a good conversation around our literacy, uh, around math, and, and, we're, and we're using language of all students. And yes, that's awesome, but we need to also focus on those students where there are disparate educational outcomes and experiences and opportunities. Yeah, so we want to tend for equity. That's what we want. We have the same goal. Um, Dr. Baker, no? Okay, then um, <clears throat> thank you very much for the presentation. We are thank listening, you. we hear you. Um, I want to thank you for participating and really speaking on behalf of not just all the other parents involved with CAC, but um, as you stated earlier, really all the parents on behalf of all the, all the students. So thank you very much. Thank, thank you again. Thank you, everybody. Um, and uh, now we have a uh, student and staff recognition um, agenda item 10.3. Hi, my name is Nak Nguyen. My pronouns are she, her. I'm a first year principal in Long Beach Unified School District. When I first became a teacher 14 years ago, it's been my dream to be the principal of Cabrillo High School. Being the youngest of nine children to two Vietnamese refugees, I didn't see a lot of educators that looked like me growing up, nonetheless in administration. Uh, and so I'm super proud to be the first Asian female high school principal in LBUSD. I think representation matters and leadership matters. For me, being principal means um, being a leader. Um, I would never ask any of my students, my colleagues, to do anything that I wouldn't do myself. And so it's really modeling that behavior. The principal sets the tone and the weather of the school. And so I know that uh, everybody's watching. Uh, and so making sure that I maintain that positivity, uh, good character, good leadership, because I know um, those are traits in a good leader. This year, our school's theme is Jags Cultivate Joy. I believe that we are always in community with each other, and uh, I'm just reminding everyone to make sure we cultivate joy for each other. I would love all of our Cabrillo students to graduate from our school feeling loved, feeling belonged, feeling that they are ready to serve their community, uh, whether it's in college or career. Um, okay, it is now time for uh, public comments. Um, we have we have three speakers for items listed on the agenda. Um, each speaker will be given three minutes. We'll start with Melissa Reiki. You can maybe help me pronounce your last name. Not sure I did that correctly. Good afternoon. My comments relate to the agenda item 17.2. The superintendent's contract commenced in 2020 and was a four-year agreement expiring in 2024. There has been a practice of extending her contract each year for an additional term of one year. This has been the case for the past two years and now the contract is set to end in 26. The board agenda item is to extend the agreement one more year to 27. This practice sounds to me like a perpetual agreement. There was extensive discussion at the last meeting and one aspect included hearing from the stakeholders. One member said, folks could have shown up here if they wished to make public comment. I point out that the I point out that community members would need to know that there is an opportunity to make public comment, how the school board works, have the availability to come at 415 on a Wednesday to put their name on a speaker's list, prepare salient points, and finally not be dissuaded by the district member who in the holding room at the last meeting discouraged students to, to speak if their point had already been made. Numerous hurdles, and these are structural inequities. And even when the community members came forward to make a comment like the four students did at the last meeting, there was retaliation. Those four students received a call slip to report to the vice principal's office 
under the premise of let's share ideas to make the facility situation better. The district has paid professionals to do this. Clearly, several of you are enamored with the superintendent's performance, but conversely, many of us teachers and parents are not. Why? One reason is because she dictates top-down policies where teachers are informed rather than being part of the decision-making process. Yet teachers know the students the best. Many won't speak out for fear of retaliation, and I've already given you an example of that. Finally, I understand, based on the council's comments at the last meeting, that there are provisions if the board feels the superintendent should not continue in her role. I suppose the district could buy out the four-year perpetual contract, but that sounds like a seven-digit number. And this is taxpayer money. Let's be fiscally responsible and stop the perpetual con contract. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Robin. Robin Chen. Sorry. Oh, man. OK, hello. My name is Robin Chen. And I'm speaking in support of the CAC parents who made recommendations to this board tonight. I apologize. I thought I was going to make my public comment before they spoke and before Mr. Miller's um, response. And um, I'm a little shaken. I'm a little, it feels like a full circle moment. And I'm, I'm not going to address Dr. Brown, but I'm going to make eye contact because I, I, I almost can't believe the response and, and, and Dr. Benitez and, and Ms. Craighead, you are very much a CAC member. So, um, so this might sound a little different, but I'm gonna read it anyways. So um, I urge you all to listen to their stories with open hearts because what they did tonight was not easy. This work, it, it isn't easy. It's heartbreaking and hopeful and infuriating and beautiful. And I understand why sometimes parents give up and leave the district or they stop believing that things will ever change. And it's because change happens so slowly. And it's hard to watch when any progress we make can be undone by a pandemic or a change in staff or a shift in priority. And, you know, it doesn't have to be this way. Big changes, systemic, long-lasting changes happen when folks change their mindset. And that can happen right now. It can happen tonight. It can happen in this moment. It's a tall order for these parents, but these parents are relentless. And, um, gosh, I love CAC parents. Um, only a CAC parent knows that sometimes progress looks like one step forward and two steps back. And it's because we play the long game. And we're not going anywhere. So thank you for listening to them. And, um, and yes, and, and thank you guys again. Um, and please, um, board members and district staff, you know that the CAC meetings are the best um, district parent group in town. So. <laughs> Uh, sometimes there's deviled eggs, I don't, I'm just saying. Thank you. Um, next we have Sovacana. I hope I've said that correctly. If not, you can correct me, please. Uh, is it okay if he uh, speaks in Khmer? He rather speak in Khmer. Some some Change 
khang ao prom yeung mien nơi long bit chip sa dr j baker got nơi ni ao mien ka vi tơ mok kan dat lueun chip sa chompua khmeing pi ka a it is an honor to to be here and i just want to pay respect to the board members and uh, i'm i'm here to talk about uh, the work that dr bakers and uh, the uh, the board uh, have been doing to uh, help the kids with special needs khñom chmuh pu swachana chie samachi sa kum khmae khñom chie atai ta chun rong krua Nung salpi ru, a salpi slappi, wheel pitcher kit, kmaika hom, nung kyom ke krom prata, a sahakum CAC. I am a member of the community and I am a survivor of the killing fields. And I am also a member of the CAC and member of the uh, community. អឺថ្ងៃនេះខ្ញុំមានសេចក្តីសបាយរីករាយប៉ុន្តែខ្ញុំក៏មានសេចក្តីទុកសោកដែលខ្ញុំនឹងចែកតម្លែកពួកខ
bị bàn khiếm đi bàn thơ anh nước xa mà mà chấm luôn xong ao còn bắc xa ao bồm đi quan tro hay giờ chết tất đã chết tim một phát protein khiếm sập ngay vía mặt bàn đôi bầm nong đài còn bắc xa bàn tệ chỉ bị sát bị thử tai vía nơi tai pram chnam hay thử tai nơi tai nơi tai bàn đầm nát thà ăn một phát nên chẳng thua nhau miền cao bồi bờ rắm na à lấy vị châu thân à bậc tham sắc xá hay cầm rắt an bảo vệ thân à ti pì nhau mình ai tự tuôi vào bàn tề sông cầm sắc xá chui thưa mấy ông con nhau miền cứ mua là than để cà riêng để cà ăn Uh, I would like the Board of Education to support the recommend recommendations from the CAC committee. And uh, my son has been uh, assessed, has been uh, tested for the last five years, but the result uh, is, is not moving anywhere. And uh, at, at this moment, uh, his uh, academic skill is uh, at second grade level. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, now we are going to items not listed on the agenda. Each speaker has three minutes, and we will start with Robert. Ma Madam Chair, uh, just one request yes. of, of our team. Um, and Mr. Strumford, we, we've had this conversation before. Um, I think we really need to look at when interpretation is required, um, the way we're keeping time. Um, there, there's a loss of time between the transition. Um, it's not always consistent at what point our interpreters, um, you know, step in. And so um, what I want to ensure is that the speaker is allocated the three minutes, even if it takes additional to an additional three minutes to make sure that we get a precise uh, interpretation. Uh, I've also made the request, and I know it's pending, right, but I want to follow up. Um, it's, it's important for us to get um, public comments that are not in English transcribed um, so that it also, in, in justice and fairness to our interpreters, gives them time to do edits, uh, come back and watch the video and make sure that they cap capture everything uh, because of the challenges, again, to do it in real time. So two, two things that I'm following up on. One is uh, to look at our uh, policy right now on the three minutes and uh, extended, extending the time. Um, many languages require more than the exact uh, amount of time because more words or different words have to be uh, used. And in addition to that, to make sure that our board uh, gets a, an accurate uh, translation, um, I want to follow up on the, the request to provide transcripts to us for comments that are not made in English. Yeah, <clears throat> let's talk uh, soon and, and about options we might have regarding the time period with translation. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So for, oh, you must be Robert. Uh, dear family and friends and employees of the Long Beach Unified School District. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm Robert Moronis. I am a campus staff assistant at Wilson High School. As many of you are aware, I have been a long standing, I've been in a long and standing effort to not only have the Long Beach Unified School District be aware of the racial aggression that particular students continually endure from other students, but also be aware of the discrimination which these students continually receive from certain Long Beach Unified School District employees. What does this discrimination look like? <clears throat> Most often, it begins with a group of overly hostile students racially profiling, disrespecting, and physically attacking other students based on their racial and cultural appearance. Then, after victims are attacked, adults who are in charge of providing, or, uh, providing equality for all children in this educational system, institution, find it reasonable for victims to be attacked for when these adult employees excuse the predatory behavior, <clears throat> their comments have been, well, look at how he's dressed. 
a concerned parent might ask, how does the student dress? It's also been said, if she doesn't want to be harassed, she needs to change the way she looks. We have to ask, what does she look like and who does she look like? There, then there is this excuse. It's Darwin's law of natural selection, survival of the fittest. Is it natural for employees who are paid to protect all children to excuse and protect aggressive students who they most often identify with? Another excuse is it's easier to get rid of one student than it is to get rid of 12. Meaning, it's appropriate to relocate one student who is being racially profiled and attacked by usually an overly aggressive group of students rather than protect all students equally. And when this victimized student is removed from his school, the overly aggressive group of students are allowed to continue its abuse on other students. What does this say to students and employees in the educational institution? What does it say to parents and guardians of those students? And in this case, what are parents, students, and educators in this institution supposed to think when a security staff member employed by the Long Beach Unified School District is being punished by the Long Beach Unified School District after reporting these safety concerns for children? Oh, it's time off. And yeah, that's your time. Okay. But thank you. So, and so but, um, I'm sorry. So what this is is it's uh, showing showing the breakdown of student population, and and some of these students in the 59 percent can't even get a holiday. Excuse okay. me, Mr. Maroney, Maroney's that. That's your time. Thank you. Um, next up, we have Jerlene. Good evening, LBUSD board and staff. My name is Jerlene Tatum. I am an LBUSD parent, parent and student advocate. Took some notes. According to the California School Boards Association, the role of the school board is to ensure that school districts are responsive to the values, beliefs, and priorities of their communities. Boards fulfill this role by performing five major responsibilities, setting direction, establishing effective and efficient structures, providing support, ensuring accountability, providing community leadership as advocates for children, the school district, and public schools. It's their responsibility to speak out on behalf of children. Authority is granted to the board as a whole, not to each board member individually. Somewhere it says that they're liaisons to the public. This does not say that they are to be, to have allegiance to the teachers union. It does not say that they were elected to serve at the will of district executive management. It does not say that they were elected to campaign for other political candidates. I share this because as we enter into the 2024 election season, I wanted to remind each of the board, reason, board members the reasons why they were elected. Last year, several of you immersed yourself into the politics of this city. Some of you intently pushed propaganda and outright lies. In doing so, you isolated your constituency, you created rifts within the community, and you ultimately violated community trust that was held for you. This year, please stay out of the politics. Instead of using your influence, instead, use your influence to build bridges and develop healthy relationships with the families of the 64,000 plus students you were elected to represent. For those of you up for re-election, Please walk the path with excellence and integrity. Yes, that's for Milliken. Please don't make false claims as some board, some board member has already done in their re-election announcement. Please hold yourself to a standard of excellence that you would expect our children to do if they were in the classroom. Just as in today's session when it was talking about how you are to set goals that are that represent the values of the community, 
You don't know the values of the community if you're not engaging with them. Thank you. Um, next, we have Ms. Velasquez. Hello, I'm Nisa Velasquez, and I'm the parent of two Millican High School students. Um, the incident is with my um, uh, sophomore student. Um, I've been talking to Mr. Vega, which is the principal at Millican since last year in regards to an incident with the six foot African American female, I mean male, sorry, that's been taunting all these kids, bullying. I have videos proof of it, okay? I've talked to him last year, he let it go, summer school came, my son went to school, the same kid attacked my son at school, obviously my son was able to move around, he swung into the locker, they got him, expelled him from summer school. This year, the first week of school, I went and talked to Mr. Vega and I told him about the situation, what's going on through the school with the same kid with the group of 15 to 20 kids, okay? Um, our group, Hispanic minority group, is a bad group considered to the school, Millican High School, because of the way they dress or well, because we come from the area, poverty areas that go out to Millican High School. I talked to Vega and I told him the, what was going on, that they needed to watch these kids because this kid was taunting these five foot kids. This kid is six foot six, okay? Nothing happened. I talked to him the first week of school. Yesterday, we had an incident that 15 parents were called in regards to a brawl. No brawl, videos, uh, videos are on. Uh, there's videos about what happened. There was no attacking, there was just verbal because a kid was coming towards the crowd. Obviously, these are other kids that are, once they see a group of kids walking, everybody runs behind them to go see what's going on, right? So they pulled the group, the minority group that they always pick on, took them to the office, they called me, and um, I spoke to Mr. Hayes, which is, I think he's, I don't know what he is there at Millican. And he pulled me out. He told me, we have this incident. Um, we're going to have to let all the kids go because we have an investigation going on. The, I go, was there anybody hit? No, there's nothing. It was just verbal. And um, it's him against 15 kids. As of now, they let 15 kids go home or more. They called everybody's parent. We all meet, meet in, the, in the lobby. They separated us. Um, they were talking to each other. Uh, the kids with the with the parents and the administrators, they and send everybody home. We're not supposed to be back till tomorrow, supposedly. I get a call today telling me that he's my son's not going to school till Friday and he is suspended. I asked them, suspended for what? Why are these 15 kids suspended or more? Why? He said because of the the uh, altercation. There was no physical fight. It was all verbal between one. One individual that has a big background that's been kicked out of multiple schools, that was kicked out of summer school because he attacked my son, and I'm just tired of it. De la Ve Vega does not listen. I talked to Mr. Hayes. I've talked to Mr. Hendrick. I'm not saying my son's perfect, but he's not, not going to slow down to anybody else. I told my son, he swings, you swing back. But until now, nothing has happened except the summer school incident that he swung on my son. Um Thank you. Before you leave, can you leave your contact information with Mr. Suarez over here um, so that somebody can get back to you um, about that so staff can look into it? Thank you. Okay. Um, next, next on the agenda, we um, have... A, a special event we started this earlier in 2023 and um, I am so happy to say we are continuing this but we have a new student board member to swear in tonight and this process started um, at the end of the spring semester where we had over I think it was around 30 students who applied to become our next student board member. Over 30 students. We whittled down that list uh, and Dr. Baker and I interviewed six finalists. And these students are the best and the brightest of the district. Uh, students, you, you can't believe their accomplishments. And of those six, we made a choice in Mr. Axel. Mr. Axel Aguilar. And I, I could not be more thrilled for everyone to have the opportunity to get to know him. He is 
a fabulously compassionate, caring, incredibly smart and accomplished student, and we are lucky to have him as part of our board, Dr. Baker. All right, so we are going to make you official, Axel. So you're going to repeat after me the official swearing in language. Okay. I, Axel Aguilar. I, Axel Aguilar. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. That I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States. That I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States. And the Constitution of the State of California. And the Constitution of the State of California. Against all enemies, foreign and domestic. Against all enemies, foreign and domestic. That I will bear true faith and allegiance. That I will bear truth, faith and allegiance. To the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of California. To the Constitution of the United States and to the Constitution of the State of California. That I take this obligation freely. That I take this obligation freely. Without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion. Without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion. And that I will well and faithfully. And that I will well and faithfully. Discharge the duties upon which I am about to enter. Discharge the duties upon which I am about to enter. Congratulations, <laughs> you are officially you. a student board member. So Axel, you're taking your official seat and you already have a name tag to join fellow board members. Axel has prepared a little bit that he'd like to share with the Board of Education and those who are watching. So I wanted to become a student board member because uh, I wanted to be a student board member for the Long Beach Unified School District because I wanted to make a difference in my community. Growing up in Long Beach, I grew up from people from all walks of life. As a first generation Mexican American, I never saw much representation for first generation students. And navigating the academic system was something that was foreign to me and my parents. However, through LBUSD's commitment to equitable and excellent education, I was able to find my voice in the district and it's through this voice that I want to help all first-generation LBUSD students to a higher education. Thank you. Well, welcome aboard. We are happy to have you. Thank um, you. And now we will continue with the agenda. Um, so next we have uh, consent calendar A, and this consent calendar groups the approval of routine agenda items into one action item for efficiency and to allow the board to focus our meetings more on student outcomes and other uh, key issues of the district. Move approval. Second. Um, any discussion? I do have a question on Item number 14.6, contract for 69300 with the Regents of the University of California, Los Angeles. And this is to provide a retreat for selected principals. My questions are, how will principals be selected? And uh, can we just send all who want to attend? Yes, yeah, so this is actually for all of our principals, K-12. They will all be participating in this opportunity. They'll have the opportunity to participate. Okay, I, so oh, one yeah. more question. Item number 34, uh, can someone elaborate on the contract increase of $15 million um, on the lease leaseback services to uh, Avalon, the uh, baseball field and the AC?
agreement with 2H Construction some time ago um, for the Avalon project. The Avalon project also entails multiple layers and phases of work. So it's customary for us to start these projects to, during what we call the pre-construction stage. It's a very early stage in design, so we basically go off of cost estimates at that point. It's then customary for us to come back to board as we bid out to subcontractors for each respective phase of work and re-up and, and basically realign our budget um, with our contractor. So we did that at one point in time in late 2022 for the HVAC portion of the work where we basically gathered some subcontractor bids, re-upped our contract with the board. Now we're basically coming back another time uh, because we've now re-upped and re-bid, actually bid our portion of the work for the field portion of the project. Um, it's a substantial increase, but that's basically in line with the market. Um, we still continue to see increases in uh, material cost increases on construction uh, materials labor shortages, supply chain issues, and it's basically magnified over on the island as well. Um, so we basically have a multiplier of sometimes two, if not three, uh, just for work associated over at the island as well. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Miranda. Okay, so um, we will have uh, our secretary take a roll call vote. Member Benitez. Aye. President Craighead? Aye. Member Lopez? Aye. Member Miller? Aye. Member Otto? Aye. And student member uh, Aguilar, preferential vote? Aye. Thank you, that passes 5-0. That's your first vote. <laughs> Did you get that on tape? <laughs> Don't worry, it's on YouTube, Axel. <laughs> um, next on the agenda, we have consent calendar B. Uh, so before that, uh, I will recuse myself from consent calendar B as I have a potential conflict of interest under government code section 1090 and 87100. SoCal Gas provides services to the Long Beach Unified School District and has in the last 12 months provided a donation to the nonprofit corporation Rancho Los Amigos Foundation, of which I am the CEO. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Otto, you had a... You Move approval. No. Yeah. Second. Uh, any further discussion? In that case, I'll ask our secretary to take a roll call vote. Member Benitez? Aye. President Craighead? Aye. Member Lopez? Aye. Member uh, Otto? Aye. And student member Aguilar, preferential vote? Aye. Thank you. That passes 4 0 with one abstention. That's your second vote, Axel. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Dr. Benitez, we don't have time for you to say that after every vote. If you could refrain. You only get one first meeting, Axel, so you got to milk it. But we do keep a tracker on every vote. No. <laughs> are you are you quite finished? President Craighead. Yes, I know. But don't tell me to go when you're. Anyhow, um, yes. So staff report. Viva, Mogi, we are uh, anxious to hear from you. <laughs> wow, thank you. On board policies. <laughs> thank you. Good evening, board members uh, and Dr. Baker and, and my colleagues. Uh, thank you so much for letting me present today. I just wanted to be extremely brief, but first, um, thank you all um, to the board members that gave me feedback last in the last board meeting around how we want to approve board policies moving forward. Um, and so from that, uh, we have decided to move forward with two paths. Uh, the first path with board policies are with minor changes. Um, when I say minor changes, they are technical changes without any um, changes to district operations. So these are also language mandated by law and so that we can also be in compliance. These board policy will, pre will be presented um, at the superintendent advisory group for review um, and then the superintendent advisory group members will report out to the entire board and the superintendent during the board meetings. Um, and then um, we would vote as a consent item during the following meeting is the first path that we will be going with. And then the second path are board policy recommendations with amendments uh, that have material changes in operations or how we do things in the district. These policy items would be presented as a first reading uh, to the entire board. And then as uh, this, um, the first reading will be an informational item uh, where there will be allowed for some 
public comment as well, and then be voted on the following meeting. So this is two paths that we're gonna go with, um, and I'm happy to answer any questions around how um, we would be moving forward with these board policies. Okay, I think that's very clear. Okay. And we look forward to our next board meeting when we will uh, have our next batch of policies. Yes, on October 4th, and then you'll vote on the policies on October 18th. Great. Okay. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, let's see. Uh, next on the agenda, new business, we have... Um, Item 17.1, approval of district response to the Los Angeles County Grand Jury Report, Career Technical educa Education Pathway, The Road Less Traveled. Move for approval. Second. Second. Uh, any discussion? I just have a question. Uh, recommendation 1.7, LBUSD should hire additional counselors to reduce their student to counselor ratio. What is the student to um, counselor ratio at the high school level? Good afternoon, uh, good, after good evening, board member. Uh, right now our numbers are, especially at our comprehensive high schools, uh, when you add the hard work that our SSI counselors are doing at the sites as well as the wellness centers that really help absorb a lot of the lift that our counselors have to do as, f as far as outside duties besides programming students and counseling students. Uh, at Cabrillo, we have a ratio of 1 to 231. At um, Jordan, we're at 1 to 297. At Lakewood, we're at 1 to 247. At Millican, we're at 1 to 360. At Poly, we're at 1 to 331. And at Wilson, we're at 1 to 332. An average of about 252 students per counselor at our high schools. Thank you, Dr. Camarino. Um, okay, so. Uh, we'll go ahead and uh, take a vote on that. So, Madam Secretary. Thank you. Member Benitez? Aye. President Craighead? Aye. Member Lopez? Aye. Member Miller? Aye. And Member Otto? Aye. And Student Member Aguilar, preferential vote? Aye. Thank you. That passes 5 0. Thank you. Next, we have item 17.2, approval of superintendent contract renewal and terms. Move for approval. Second. Uh, any discussion? Madam Secretary? Oh, we have, oh, I'm sorry, Ms. Lopez. Yeah, I'd just like to suggest that after tonight's vote, um, we really consider eliminating that additional year um, and only because it can be misleading to the community where the community may be under the impression we're voting for uh, for another year versus you know right now 2027 having the four-year um, uh, contract so that we're doing this maybe every four years versus on a yearly uh, basis and just adding that extension. Thank you. Mr. Otto, you have your light on? No, oh, sorry. No? Okay. Uh, Madam Secretary? <coughs> Member Benitez? Aye. President Craighead? Aye. Member Lopez? Aye. Member Miller? Aye. Member Otto? Aye. And student <coughs> member, oh, does he vote on this one? Yeah, okay. Student <laughs> member Aguilar preferential vote. Aye. Thank you. That passes 5 0. Thank you. Um, next, we have report of board members. Uh, <clears throat> Mr. Aguilar, if you'd like to say anything else, you can have uh, the mic again. How does it feel to be a student board member? It feels really good. Like, <laughs> <laughs> it's probably one of the best opportunities I've had and I'm ready and I'm excited to make the most of this opportunity. You were such an impressive candidate. When you left the room, when Mrs. Craighead and I completed your interview, we looked at each other and said, not only are you a stellar student on track to be the valedictorian at Jordan <laughs> High School this year, yeah. but the humanity that you bring into everything you do is incredible. So you are going to bring that same to this room 
and we're so glad to have you. Thank you. Also want to acknowledge Mr. Suarez, who is a very important part of the onboarding process for a student board member, spent time with Axel today, and will continue to nurture him along, alongside his fellow board members. I also understand there's someone in the audience here tonight that you should introduce. Yeah, so uh, s someone in the audience here to support me is my teacher and, as I like to say, mentor, Miss Valdivias. Uh, I just like to say just thank you so much for all the guidance and support you've given me. It really means a lot to me that there's teachers like you in the district that really make a difference in students' lives. That's wonderful. Thank you. And I know you're going to be a bright spot every meeting. Uh, Mr. Miller. Uh, yes, I'll be brief uh, as... Uh, and, you know, it's getting, we're ending a little earlier than usual, but it's still fairly late. So, and it's been a long day, you know. Uh, today we had uh, a really, really important conversation from a board perspective. And it is uh, board goals, but I more importantly consider this uh, our accountability metrics. That's what that is for me. That is really holding both us and our team here to the tried and true purposes of our roles as board members, which is uplifting uh, those students in particular who have truly not had a voice or have underperformed and need a voice. And so uh, when I think about our work today, uh, though there's still a whole lot of more work to do, uh, I was quite proud of the group that we have here in the admin team uh, for your support in this process as I know that we will uh, only do what is best for our students and more importantly for the district. So uh, all in all, I just wanted to thank everybody for their help, especially uh, A.J. Crabhill thus far and his support in uh, this board goals and guardrails process. Uh, though we still got a little bit more work to go, I'm uh, quite inspired by the work that we've already done. Thank you, Dr. Benitez. I'll be brief as well, President Craighead. So just wanna thank our CAC members again for sticking with it, uh, really. And, and so uh, in addition to the ones that were able to make these recommendations tonight, uh, I know it took a whole lot of other uh, work uh, from the members um, on an ongoing basis. So you know, keep at it, keep at it, keep holding us accountable. Um, I also want to thank um, the folks that came out for our, our, for our, from our three different schools this morning during our morning uh, session. So we had an uh, elementary school. Um, what was our middle school? Stanford. Stanford. Yeah, Dow. That's yeah, right. Hawks. And then, yeah. And then uh, high school. So uh, particularly the students that made some time uh, this morning to share their um, perspectives as 10th graders uh, with us. Um, I think it grounded our conversation, Mr. Miller, around board goals uh, as well. And then lastly, uh, I, I too think we had a, a really good, a productive conversation. So I'm looking forward to this board uh, adopting board uh, goals and guardrails, monitoring them, and then our district accomplishing uh, these goals. That's my report. Fabulous. Mr. Otto? Um, yeah, I, I also want to compliment uh, the staff on the uh, the uh, workshop that we had this morning. I think it was uh, very productive, and um, you know, there's a famous uh, old saying about if you don't know where you're going, any road will take you there. Um, we don't have any goals, we don't have any guardrails, and now that we are in the process of getting those goals and guardrails, we will be able to talk about whether we're where, where it is that we're going and be accountable to the community. So I, I think this was a great step and uh, we didn't finish uh, the goals and guardrails that we were uh, or voted on because we're not quite there yet, but we will be very, very soon. And uh, I'm looking for, forward to a discussion at the, at, at the very next meeting. Um, it's the beginning of the school year, even though we're almost a month into it now, or we are a month into it, but it's very exciting. Um, 
uh, we're, we're we've charted we're beginning to chart a course about what the board's goals are and and what we will be thinking and we're looking forward to working with the superintendent uh, 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 for the future of what, where the district's going. So that's it. Wonderful, uh, Ms. Lopez. I'd like to acknowledge the Assistance League of Long Beach for providing uniforms, backpacks, books, and supplies to students at Dooley Elementary School. Uh, Operation School Bell was definitely a success last Saturday. Uh, thank you for those donations because it brought many smiles to uh, many students. And I also like to acknowledge all the individuals that were there volunteering on a Saturday. So thank you, your hard work obviously made this uh, event very successful. Back to School Night is around the corner, and I'd like to extend my gratitude to the teachers and administrators who are working hard to prepare their classrooms and their schools um, and getting ready to meet their students, uh, parents, and guardians. Good luck to you all uh, as you go over your classroom rules, expectations, and goals for the year. And then finally, I'd like to uh, commend the faculty, the staff, and the students at McKinley Elementary School for the way they handled the lockdown this week. That's it, thank you. Thank you. I'm glad you mentioned Operation School Bell. Um, the Assistance League provides approximately 12,000 uniforms to our students each and every year, each and every school year. And it was a very celebratory event with um, a backpack giveaway, school supplies, books, and uniforms. Um, so thank you to uh, the Assistance League and everybody else. There was a sorority group that was there um, providing help and face painting and all kinds of stuff. And even though it was drizzling, it was uh, <clears throat> a fabulous uh, <clears throat> celebration. Um, I was able to attend um, an event for ground education, and I don't know if everybody's aware of what ground education is, but this is a nonprofit organization that's in approximately 25 of our schools, I think, and they, um, they provide education outside the classroom. So they build raised vegetable beds, and when they're in a school, every child in that school has an opportunity um, to attend an outdoor class, I think weekly, so every week. So the kids bring their chairs out, they go outside, they have all these hands-on um, opportunities, and it. I think it shows the kids that learning doesn't always have to happen in a classroom, that the whole world is full of possibilities when it comes to learning. And also that in Long Beach right now, there's an opportunity for all of us to help out. <clears throat> so it's Long Beach Gives, and you can, you can go online and you can check and see what charities you'd like to support. And they have different categories, you know, education or um, families, uh, you know, that type of thing. And I just want to encourage everybody, go online, have a look, and see if there might be, um, you know, charities that you're willing to support a lot of them support our schools, and that's why I mention it here. And then thank you to all of our um, presenters and, and everyone who contributed to our workshop this morning. Uh, it was wonderful to have <clears throat> our research people come and really um, tell the or uh, use the data to tell a story. And I think that was a really interesting perspective on on receiving data on how it tells a story. And then it is National Backpack Day, I believe. So um, it's kind of, you know, late in the evening, but, but maybe a heads up for parents. If you can lighten the load in your child's backpack and, you know, and let's pay attention to um, what the kids are carrying around because sometimes, especially with these little kids, the backpacks are bigger than they are. And that's not healthy for their little bodies, so I think maybe Backpack Awareness Day, that's a good thing. Um, <clears throat> anyhow, Dr. Baker. Thank you. I think Dr. Benitez has a backpack story to share. Uh, talk to my daughter's teachers, uh, Madam President, about lightening the load. 
<laughs> he had to reteach putting the backpack on both shoulders to not get one shoulder sore. Thank you. First, I want to just acknowledge um, the schools and staff that participated this morning and those who helped to prepare even the, the data and other things related to goals and guardrails. Um, between our last session and today, a lot of work went into that, and that work pays off because we're on the road to getting goals and guardrails. So thank you for the really good discussion, centering our students and just the work that you did um, following our student or our school presentations. Um, behind Ms. Lopez are some important banners. This is a great uh, month of celebration in our district from September 15th to October 15th. We celebrate Latinx Heritage Month um, and our schools have wonderful assets to acknowledge this month and we'll have similar assets to acknowledge the histories and celebrate culture across our schools. So this month, as you can see, things are going out to our schools to really um, uplift the Latinx community and heritage, and there are all kinds of festivities happening across the district. So just encourage you and anybody who's watching to participate and to really um, be a part of that celebration. And some of the ways that you can do that, actually tomorrow night, most of our elementary schools will have back to school night. So that was mentioned, it's actually tomorrow night. And before we meet again, middle schools will conduct back to school night on the 28th. So parents, community members who wanna see what's going on in schools, please be sure to come out to our schools. Um, wanna acknowledge the incredible work of the Office of Curriculum Instruction and Professional Development. We have approximately 285 new teachers that were hired to start this school year. More than 200 of them attended the New Teacher Institute this year, which is a real opportunity to get to know those in our Long Beach Unified community that will be supporting them, to get critical information, and to immerse themselves in the culture of being a teacher. Some of them were literally, are literally first year teachers. Some have come from other districts pursuing a district that has excellent excellence and equity as their agenda. And so thank you, Chris, and to your team and others who supported the New Teacher Institute from across, across the district. In addition to that, we've already had, let me look at my notes. How many teachers, Chris, go through training? 400 plus 400 so of our staff in a project that we have um, full-time release substitutes in the district to release our teachers to come for professional development, both in their content or their subject area as well as elementary teachers. So um, with our ESSER investments this year, all of our staff will have the opportunity to be released, to not have to go after school, but to be released from their classroom to come and work with their colleagues and um, staff from the Office of Curriculum Instruction on culturally relevant pedagogy, tools, um, increasing their toolkit in their subject area. And so already it's off to a great start. I think the first was September 10th. Your team, the 11th, went into, went into action. So more to come. We'll, we'll want to hear from teachers on that and what it's been like for them to experience um, this year's training. And then just two other things. Next week, Sankofa Parent Village for African American Black Families meets on the 27th at 530. And lastly, to our students, if they are watching high school students, applications for RSVP, which is Raising Student Voices and Participation, it's the name of my student advisory, applications are out. It will be a way that Axel will have an opportunity to test things out, to talk to students from across the district. If he's interested in the subject, if he goes to a training that's on being a school board member, he'll have an opportunity to engage with students from across the district. I'm sure you'll have other ideas for how to do it, but that will bring an opportunity for him, not just for me, to hear from, from students and what they, um, what, they, what they need from us in our school district. So that's my report for tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Baker. <clears throat> well, this concludes the business of this evening's meeting. Our next regular meeting is Wednesday, October 4th. I declare this meeting adjourned. Thank you, everybody.